you go. Today, we're beginning a major new sermon series called You'll Get Through This. And if you are facing adversity, if you're doing the right thing, but the wrong thing is happening to you, if your life feels like one setback after another, then this series is for you. There is good news for you today. God says you'll get through this. If you grew up in a dysfunctional family and you are desperately trying to break free from the weirdness of it all, if you feel trapped by your family circumstances, then this series is for you. God says you'll get through this because the same God who delivered Joseph from all his troubles 3,700 years ago is looking after you. The same God who preserved and rescued Joseph will preserve and rescue you. How deep a pit was Joseph in? Well, his brothers tried to kill him. Can you imagine your own family hating you so much that they sell you into slavery? How about spending the best years of your life in prison for a crime you never committed? Maybe we can't imagine anything that bad. But have you almost given up hope of anything good happening to you? Are you hanging on for dear life? Hey, if you're at your wit's end, Joseph would come up to you right now and say, you'll get through this. How can Joseph be so positive after all the terrible, unjust hardships he endured? Well, Joseph had a dream. Do you have a dream? What is inside you? I'm asking because I see signs of life. Is there still hope in your heart? A dream, a passion, a longing, a promise you are holding on to? Maybe many years ago, God touched your life and there was a fire lit deep down in your soul that's never totally gone out. If there's anyone watching this now and you have a dream that might make no sense to anyone else, but you know that you are somehow supposed to do something in this world? Well, Joseph held on to the dream that God had put in his heart. Despite all the difficulty, the drudgery and destitution, despite the chains of slavery, all through the years he spent in jail, God was whispering to Joseph what he whispers to you right now. You'll get through this. We learn from the life of Joseph about the sovereignty of God. Not a tiny God who really can't do much. No, a gigantic God who determines and orchestrates seeming coincidences. We are going to see that when your life looks like one big mess, when it feels like you are being hit by a, a series of random chaotic events, we're going to see a massive sovereign God who brings about his purposes and his plans to achieve nothing less than the salvation of the world. Folks, the story of Joseph is sublime because it doesn't just transcend the muddle of everyday life, it makes sense of the turmoil of everyday life. Incredibly, we see that there is a purpose, after all, in past hurts. It's a story that's got everything, money, sex, power, betrayal, God, incarceration, famine, sometimes all in the same chapter. It's probably the greatest story about forgiveness and unforgiveness that has ever been told. In 1968, it captured the imagination of a 20-year-old called Andrew Lloyd Webber. He lived near South Kensington Tube and dropped out of Oxford University to walk his pet cats and compose musicals. But how do you get one of your musicals performed 
when you are only 20 years old. In 1968, he wrote one for a school in Barnes called Collet Court. It was called Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And Jason Donovan, Donny Osman, and H from Steps will be forever grateful. If you're coming from a Muslim background, then this series might be the most accessible thing you will ever hear at a Christian church because the story of Joseph is the only complete story in the Quran. The only story in the Quran that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. If you are from a Muslim background and maybe none of your family know that you're watching, then I hope you will enjoy the journey because we are about to depart for a fascinating adventure. So, let's now go back 3,700 years and meet one of the worst dads in the Bible. His name was Jacob. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Let's stop right there. Joseph's brothers were the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. What? Bilhah and Zilpah were his wives. Bilhah was his first wife. Then, I don't know, maybe she died and then Jacob married Zilpah? No. Bilhah and Zilpah are both alive at the same time. And Jacob had slept with them both and had kids with them both but Jacob wasn't married to either of them. And it was Jacob's real wives, Leah and Rachel, who suggested the idea. There is a life lesson for us here. If you ever find yourself encouraging your husband to sleep with the au pair, if you ever find yourself telling your husband to get into bed with the maid, something has gone seriously wrong. And what's this about Jacob having wives, plural? Wasn't God's original plan one man married to one woman? How come Jacob is a polygamist? Well, Jacob was a trickster, a schemer, and a grafter who tricked his brother Esau out of his birthright and then conned his father Isaac into getting Isaac's blessing. Jacob had managed to do this by exploiting the fact that his poor old dad Isaac was going blind. So, Jacob famously and comically impersonated his hairier brother Esau, and the trick worked. Isaac's precious deathbed blessing was stolen by Jacob with his pantomime, fake hairy arms. And when Esau came in from the field 10 minutes later, <gasps> It was too late. Jacob, having been egged on by his manipulative mother, Rebecca, had gotten away with it. But God is big enough to remember such things. And so years later, when running away from Esau, who was set on revenge, Jacob meets the beautiful Rachel by a well. Rachel is a real stunner. Jacob falls in love, wants to marry her. But Jacob, the trickster, gets tricked. Jacob had been dazzled by Rachel's good looks, but he had not reckoned on one of the greatest hustlers, scammers, and swindlers of all time, a superb con artist called Laban. Rachel's dad, Laban, had already got Jacob signed up for seven years hard labor, but Laban really needed to marry off Rachel's older sister, Leah. So Laban comes up with an audacious plan. Laban decides to switch 
the two veiled girls on Jacob's wedding night. Now, <laughs> you and I might think, surely Jacob will notice? But no, this is why Laban is such a player. Laban gambles on the fact that Jacob, having waited seven years, won't be hanging around. And lo and behold, Jacob has sex with Leah. The deceiver is deceived. When Jacob realizes, he says, oh, oh no, I've made a major error. Laban says, huh, sorry Jacob, but think about it from my point of view. I had to marry off the older sister first, but hey, no problem. All you need to do, Jacob, is work for me for another seven years, making 14 in total, and then we'll be all squared away, done and dusted. And that's how come Jacob ends up married to both sisters. Now, I don't know whether you have ever experienced sibling rivalry, but by any reckoning, it is compounded when your sister is married to the same man as you. Rachel and Leah become very competitive, and when your sister is having more kids with your husband than you are, it does become really annoying. And so, Rachel and Leah come up with some crazy schemes, like suggesting Jacob sleep with the maid. The rules of the competition are simple. She who has the most kids wins. Leah and Rachel begin a contest in terms of who can produce the most children, irrespective of whether it's you or your domestic servant who actually give birth to them. As long as Jacob is the dad, every kid counts. It's a sort of human arms race which Leah wins, hands down. But Rachel has the last laugh because when she finally gets pregnant, it turns out that Jacob loves Rachel's two sons more than all the other 10 put together. Incidentally, it is amazing to think that all this time, our friend Jacob, the cartoon bad dad, was also carrying the promises of God. This should encourage us all. God does not choose perfect people. No, God chooses deeply flawed people who make terrible mistakes. Jacob is so central to God's plan for the world that he even gets renamed Israel. And so, we read, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. It can be terribly damaging when a parent so obviously has a favorite son. The country music star Johnny Cash spent half his life struggling to get over the fact that his dad, Ray Cash, had a favorite son, and it wasn't Johnny. Back in Dias, Arkansas, that was Jack Cash. Jack Cash could do no wrong in the eyes of Ray Cash, and when Jack died in an accident in 1944, Ray Cash said that the wrong son had died. It should have been Johnny who died. Johnny Cash ended up spiraling into drink and drugs until he committed his life to Jesus. Johnny Cash then teamed up with the great evangelist Billy Graham, and Johnny Cash spent years singing gospel songs in prisons. It was like having Elvis visit you in prison to sing to you about Jesus. But that was the end of the story. I've skipped over the years of substance abuse and addiction. Psychologist Mallory Williams says, the non-favored child will experience low self-worth and value, feelings of rejection and inadequacy, and a sort of giving up due to feeling like they can never be worthy of the same attention, love, and affection that the favored child receives. This often has long-term implications on their performance in school, in jobs, and in 
interpersonal relationships as the parenting relationship sets the foundation and expectations of future relationships. Is that you? Does it feel like your parents loved your brother or sister more than you? So much better to be the favorite son or the favorite daughter, don't you think? Well, what happens if you are the favorite son or daughter? Because of the praise and favoritism they experience, they often have difficulty with failure of any kind, says Williams. They often feel so much pressure to keep up their star performance that they feel that there's no room for mistakes. They also are prone to rejection or a tense relationship at the very least with a non-favored sibling and find it hard to repair such a relationship feeling that they did nothing to create the situation. That is exactly how Joseph feels for the whole of chapter 37. Joseph is like, what did I do? Joseph is genuinely mystified as to why his brothers have taken such a dislike to him. Joseph fails to realize that when it says in verse 2 that Joseph brought a bad report about his brothers, Joseph has failed to understand the time-honored concept that no one likes a grass. Next, Joseph's lack of self-awareness and lack of modesty become almost laughable. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of corn out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood, up, stood upright while your sheaves gathered round mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what? He had said. And we'll pick it up from there next time. Because here's the thing. It's Joseph's dream. It's Joseph's gift that is getting him into all this trouble. The same gift that made his brothers hate him, the same gift will eventually save them. They will eventually bow down and thank God for Joseph and Joseph's dreams. So just before we close, what lessons can we learn? Firstly, from the life of Jacob. <laughs> what a rascal he was. Let's just for a second go all the way back and just read three verses from the hairy arms chapter. This is the bit in Genesis 27 where Jacob deceives his blind father Isaac by pretending to be Esau. Jacob went to his father and said, My father. Yes, my son, Isaac answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. When Jacob says, I am Esau, I am screaming, no, no, it's all a terrible lie. You didn't, you're not at all, it's a lie. You, you didn't go out hunting. Your mum just prepared it back in the kitchen. Jacob, you're a barefaced liar. Jacob, you're a mummy's boy who needs to be taught a lesson. But the very next thing that happens is that Jacob sees a stairway to heaven at a place called Bethel. God perseveres with Jacob despite Jacob's character and integrity issues. So when we look at the whole of Jacob's life, what lessons can we learn? Number one, if you favor 
some of your kids over against others, if you have favourites, even if you're only repeating what you grew up with, sooner or later, you will have trouble and strife in your home. Number two, don't make the mistake of thinking that your past relationships have somehow disqualified you. Jacob's past was far more complicated than yours. And Jacob never lost the favour and blessing of God. Number three, don't make the mistake of thinking that God only works through squeaky clean, perfect families. God never gave up on Jacob and is still working today through Jacob's descendants. Number four, don't make the mistake of thinking that God will only use you if your kids are all sorted. What Reuben got up to with Bilhah and what Judah got up to with his daughter-in-law would be too hot even for the Jeremy Kyle show. If God used Jacob, then God will use you. What lessons can we learn from the life of Joseph? Number one, if you have been brought up in a dysfunctional family, you can still see your dreams come true. Number two, you might think that it's all about hearing from God. It's not. The way you share your dream can either make you or break you. Maybe you have a gift. Maybe you have a dream. But rather than everyone cheering you on, it just leaves around, those around you feeling cold. When I was Joseph's age, I was like Joseph in that I was full of myself. I was like, hey, what's not to like about me? Uh, everything. I thought that God had touched my life, but rather than being humble about it, I was tactless and inconsiderate. The way I spoke to people about it was brash and boorish. Looking back now, I wish I'd taken the low road. In fact, I wish I'd read the story of Joseph. Because if I had, maybe I'd never have had to learn the hard way. Joseph had to learn the hard way. It was a long, hard road that led to prison and slavery in Egypt. But the reason why I'm so excited about this story is because it turns out that the only way that Jacob's family could later survive starvation. The only way that in future there would be any Jews living on the face of the earth was through Joseph being sold into the breadbasket of Egypt. If Jacob's family had all died in the famine, then Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, would never have been born. It's because of Joseph's blundering motor mouth, which landed him in Egypt, that you have the hope of Christ and eternal life today.